Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to Talks at Google. Uh, my name is Jason Crane, and I'm proud to welcome Deborah Madison here today. Um, for over three decades, Deborah Madison has been at the vanguard of the vegetarian cooking movement, authoring classic cookbooks on the subject and emboldening millions of readers to cook simple, elegant, plant-based food. Deborah Madison is the author of 14 cookbooks now and is well known for her simple, seasonal, vegetable-based cooking. She got her start at San Francisco Bay Area uh, Chez Panisse before opening Greens and has lived in New Mexico for the last 20 years. In addition to writing and teaching, she has served on the boards of Slow Food International, Biodiversity Committee, the Seed Savers Exchange, and the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance, among others. She is actively involved in issues of biodiversity, gardening, sustainable agriculture. It is my great pleasure to welcome Deborah Madison today. Thank you very much for coming, Deborah. Thank you so very much. It's really a treat to be here. I know you who work here, it's every day, but those of us who just Google at home, it's sort of amazing to, um, to actually be on the campus and see what you do and how fabulous it is. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about because this is such a youthful audience, um, about how things used to be and where we came from. And, and if there's anything that you want me in particular to talk about, I'm happy to do that too. Um, so I started cooking a long time ago. Um, when I started cooking for other people, it was in the 70s, early 70s, actually late 60s. And in San Francisco, at the San Francisco Zen Center, so this is probably before most of you were born. And um, at that time, our mothers were being seduced by companies who wanted them to make TV dinners and Stouffer souffles and chicken pot pies. And you know, it was the beginning of big food, really, and um, ease in the kitchen, and which in part was easy to understand. It was just after World War II, and it was a stressful time for women, and they liked to be relieved of that. And as a kid, my, my mom didn't buy into this at all because she didn't want to spend the money on food, but occasionally there'd be sales on pot pies. And this was a big moment, you know, that they'd go out and we could have those. Um, but by the time I got to um, move from Davis, California to San Francisco and was living at the Zen Center, and I decided I wanted to cook there because I knew I was going to be there and be working, and it looked like the most interesting thing to do. And so when we had a house meeting one night, there were about 60 of us who, who lived in a beautiful old um, building on Page Street. Um, we needed a cook, and my hand shot up. And I didn't even really know I wanted to do that. I just, I guess I did want to do it. Um, so nobody else did, so the job was mine. And what I inherited in this kitchen on Page Street was a storeroom filled with grains and groats and grits whole grains, you know. And nobody knew how to cook them or what to do with them. But there was this sort of prevailing idea that what our parents w were doing was not so good, and we could make it better. We should make it better. You know you know how kids know everything, and um, especially what's wrong with your parents and the way they're living. Except that, that we really didn't know how to cook. We didn't know a grain from a groat from a grit. Uh, we didn't know their properties. Um, nobody knew how to cook anything, really, because it's not what we were being taught or what we were learning at school or at home, and there were no cooking schools, I might add. Um, so we just plunged in. And the resulting vegetarian, usually food, was extremely heavy and dark and gray and brown and grim. And there, was a, there were restaurants like the Good Karma Cafe over on Valencia Street or um, the Minimum Daily Requirement, the MDR, that were kind of the, the vegetarian restaurants at the time. And it just wasn't, you'd have to have a very strong um, ethical uh, profile to really enjoy eating this food because it really was not very good. So um, this is what I inherited, and I didn't know how to cook it either. Um, but we did buy a grain mill. We grained our, we grained some of these, uh, ground some of these whole grains into flour for making bread. That was good. We could make muffins and pancakes, but. The cook who had preceded me was macrobiotic, and he was really a good cook, but 
he kind of stayed true to a lot of uh, macrobiotic principles. We had no sugar, we had no butter, we had no eggs. It kind of, sounds kind of vegan, doesn't it? And sort of modern. So pancakes, if you could call them that, were these flat rubbery things like the soles of your shoes. You know, nothing had any lift, nothing was light, um, especially when he tried to make Western style food. So I did the backwards thing. It looks backwards from today. I introduced butter and baking powder and baking soda and eggs and um, cheese because I was really cooking for a community and a community like a family is strengthened when it eats together, when it shares food together, it talks over meals. Um, you know, you're being nourished by the same ingredients. And the way it was then, People didn't really want to eat miso soup for breakfast and tofu and soybeans and things like that. So they'd go down to a cafe on the corner called Lum's Cafe, and they would have pancakes and eggs and toast and smoke a cigarette, drink coffee, read the newspaper, you know, like most people do. So my job was really to bring the cooking more in line with the tastes of the students who were there and what they would stay around and be comfortable eating. And, um, and that's what I did. I mean, I really went from miso soup and tofu and stuff like that for breakfast, which I actually happen to really like, but went from that to more familiar foods, you know, to pancakes that look like pancakes um, that we were used to, to maple syrup, to put a little butter on them. Um, I don't know what Zen Center is like nowadays, but I bet it has a really heavy vegan component. And I bet a lot of those foods are pushed way to the side. I may be wrong, but in any case, being a Zen student was not being about food. It was about Zen practice and Zen study. So it's not like we were a cooking school or trying to, to do something um, with food, but I took my job seriously. You know, how do you get people to the table? You serve something that they recognize. Oh, it's lasagna. It may be vegetarian lasagna, but it looked right. You know, that's very different than having something on the plate and you go, what is that? You know, you don't know what it is. You're a little nervous about it. You're not really relaxed. It's hard to kind of dig in. It's real hard to explain it to a guest who's there. Um, like if we came to Google and everything was just utterly strange and so just utterly wonderful, you know, we'd be saying, well, what is this you're eating? What is, your do what is it you're doing? It, people, human beings get nervous if they don't understand, you know. So anyway, um, that's how I got started cooking. And I did that for about 18 years at Zen Center. I cooked in a lot of different capacities. I cooked um, for students. Um, in everyday kind of situations at the Zen Center in San Francisco. I cooked for sashins, which are seven day intensive periods of meditation um, where nobody's talking and you really have to think it out because the meals are served in a zendo, they're, feel, they're, they're served formally. Um, you wanna feel light and nourished at the same time, not heavy. You don't wanna fall asleep afterwards during meditation. I was a private chef for the abbot and his friends, and my motto was always <laughs> tea for two and six for tea. You know, it was like, oh, well, we can add six more or ten more. And I'd be running down to the field at Green Gulch and harvesting a little bit more food to cook. That was really um, hard, but it gave me a chance to do cooking that was more elaborate and, and more adventurous, really, and more interesting, and more the kind of foods that eventually um, showed up at Green's. So you were asking about greens and how that started. Is that what you wanted to know? So Zen Center owns um, a property uh, near Big Sur called um, Tassajara or Zen Mountain Center, and it's our monastery. And dur during, during the year, it's for 100-day long periods of intense practice, um, two of them back to back. And then in the summer, we're open to guests, and guests can come down, and they can just be guests, and they can relax and so forth. So we cooked our food. Originally, it wasn't vegetarian because it was owned by a family that wasn't vegetarian, and so, Ed Brown would be in there making lamb chops and things, and the rest of us would be hanging around like hungry dogs, you know, going, 
can I have some of that? You know, will there be any leftover? I mean, actually, we weren't really very good at vegetarian cooking. I mean, people were hungry. They they just wanted, lusted for something more sustaining, um, especially meat. So that wasn't going to work. So we decided to scratch that menu and just do vegetarian food. And because Tassajara is so isolated, have ever, any of you ever been there? You have. Oh, you have. Okay. So you know, it's like this 18 mile road that goes up and it goes down and it winds and there's like a 10,000 foot drop on one side and it's not a road you're going to take casually to go to town and find something to eat that you'd prefer. <laughs> so basically we had a captive audience and um, and we got better at cooking the food over the years. Um, I also cooked there, did the guest season and people would say, because a lot of our guests were from the Bay Area, do you think you could open a restaurant in San Francisco? And, you know, you begin to hear that enough, and then you begin to think, well, maybe. And then Fort Mason opened when the GGNRA started, and they were looking for a restaurant as a tenant, but it had to be a nonprofit. Um, now, most restaurants are nonprofit, but not by intention, you know. Um, it just had to be an organization that was nonprofit, and the Zen Center was. Um, and it just seemed like the perfect fit. So we got this building. It's the same space where it is today, and it was a disaster. I mean, it was filled with uh, with old big pieces of machinery that reeked of oil, and the windows were about five feet above where you know you, uh, above the ground, above the floor. So we had to build a false floor because you're not going to have windows. You can't look out and see the Golden Gate Bridge and the San Francisco Bay. <laughs> that would be really cruel. Um, so it took about a year to build out this space. And during that year, I actually worked at Chez Panisse, or the, maybe the year before I started working at Chez Panisse, I had met Alice Waters and her pastry chef, Lindsay Shear. They came to Green Gulch to look at our farm, and I was asked to show them around. And, um, and as I did, I was sort of saying things like, have you ever heard of Richard Only? Do you make tarte tatin? Do you do this? Do you do that? And finally, Alice said, haven't you ever been to the restaurant? Well, on $50 a month stipend, no, I hadn't. So she said, I'd like to invite you. Bring somebody. So, um, so the next night, um, I went with a friend. And we were smitten. And it's like I'd had this long quest for what I thought French food was or should be. And and, and never found it, and there I found it. And I can still remember everything that we ate and how amazing it was. I just came back and told my abbot, I have to work there. I, I, that's what I'm going to do. I have to work there. And I started the next day. And, um, and it was an amazing experience to work there. It was a lot of fun. Um, two years later, uh, I didn't know that there was this restaurant idea. Of course, that's why I got to work there, because I was going to be the chef. But I didn't know that. <laughs> so I thought I was just learning a little bit about how to cook at Chez Panisse. Um, then one day, it was like, well, you're going to open you're going to open this restaurant. And so I did. And it, you know, it really Chez Panisse is a very special restaurant. It's not like any place else. So if that's your only experience of a restaurant, and you and it happens to fit your own vision perfectly, to open a big restaurant and do things in a conventional way is really hard. Um, I didn't want things like rolling racks, which you absolutely have to have in a restaurant. I mean, there are these big industrial racks that you put sheet pans on. I said, oh, no, I don't want those. You know, <laughs> we're do, going to do everything by hand. Um, this is going to be really soulful. Well, actually, it was a pretty soulful kitchen. But we did get rolling racks, and thank heavens we did, because, you know, you have to, like, wake up and be smart at some point <laughs> or you're, you're going to hate it. It was um, really hard doing that restaurant. We suddenly had a big restaurant. Uh, we got a great review within the first three weeks, which meant we were serving 300 plus lunches a day. Um, none of my staff were cooks, so I had to teach them all how to cook. I'm learning myself how to run a restaurant. Um, the, the learning curve was pretty much like that. 
and it was it was just breathtaking. It was so <laughs> difficult, um, but we you know we had to figure out how to do things. We had lots of failures. We had some successes. We focused on the successes, and then we began to build. And you know, eventually opened for dinner. And you know, in the beginning, our menus were written like five minutes before dinner time, <laughs> and Xerox, and there were misspellings. Nobody understood that it's espresso, not expresso, and <laughs> and um, all those kind of nightmare things. Um, but actually, the restaurant really worked. And I would say that most of our customers were not vegetarian. They were coming because I had a little reputation. They were curious. Um, there was lots of parking. And, and there was a view of the bay. I mean, what more could you want? And so it was mainly women coming to try it out. And then they'd come back on the weekends with their husbands. And you could see these men being dragged in. They didn't want to go to a vegetarian restaurant on Saturday night. They wanted a steak. And um, so I had to, to really make food that would put them at ease and would, would offer them something that would take the place of that meat in the center of the plate. So I did food that was complicated. I did, you know, like dosa, a little crepes and, and folded and stacked and rolled and, and um, things that had form and shape in the, in the middle of the plate that the eye could go to, um, a sauce or whatever. Uh, you know, it was kind of complicated cooking, which is why the Greens Cookbook is, is my most complicated book, probably. But it had to be that. It, I had to offer something to take the place. Now I think it's very different times. Um, I don't think we need to do that so much. I think vegetarian food can be and is much simpler. Um, people understand now, just because you're having it on one Saturday night, it doesn't mean you're signing up for a lifestyle unless you want to. You know, so you can take a break. Uh, lots of people might order vegetarian food in a restaurant because it's just different from having salmon, lamb, beef, you know, and chicken and the same thing over and over again. It's, it's just another way of eating. Um, for some people, it's the only way of eating. Uh, some people are pescatarians or porkitarians or, you know, they have their exceptions. Um, and it's not for me to say what's right, what's wrong. I, in my experience as a cooking teacher, I think we change a lot through our lives. Um, I do know a man, a political cartoonist, um, who's rather well known. He's Australian, and he has been vegetarian for three generations in his family. And he's perfectly fine with that. Um, he doesn't like me. He doesn't know. He doesn't like it. He doesn't know it. It's not on his horizon. It's just not there, you know. And he's comfortable. On the other hand, I've taught classes where somebody will say, I've been a vegetarian for 20 years, and I keep dreaming of turkey. What's wrong with me? I said, why don't you have some turkey and find out? Maybe it, it has something that you need. Um, maybe you can get it another way if, if you don't want to eat it, but find out what it's about. We, we all move around and shift a lot of times. So, so do books. Um, so, uh, did this used to be orange? The spine? <laughs> I think it did. Um, so after I left Greens, I'll backtrack just a little bit. I, um, at one point, I was invited to go to Esalen and teach for a week and teach everything about vegetarian food from soup to nuts. And it was exhausting because I had to gather all this information. None of it was in one place. And after I left, I thought, oh, I wish there were a vegetarian joy of cooking. It would make my life so much easier. And you have one of those aha moments. You're pumping gas in your car, and you're thinking, oh, I guess I'm the one that's going to write that. <laughs> Seven years later, I came out. It was a huge, huge project. But soy milk, for example, if you were interested in soy milk, you had to get a little pamphlet at a health food store. You know, it was something exotic and, and kind of dreadful, actually, and, and over there. Um, you, you know, it, it, of course, hemp milk and almond milk and rice milk and all these other milks didn't even exist then. But um, I thought, why not put this all together instead of having something be in a corner? You know, just put it all under the same cover. So I wrote this book. And for many years, I was the vegetarian Dhamma Matrix. 
on the cover with the spoons. Um, and this was really orange. And yesterday I was at 10 speed and I noticed that somebody was using this under their computer to, <laughs> to lift it up. So, um, and I have traveled uh, not just once with this book and now with the new vegetarian cooking for everyone, I can tell you, you can use it in more than one way. You can uh, use it to lift, uh, lift things up with. But this came out, and it was exactly what I wanted. It was called the Vegetarian Joy of Cooking originally, but Joy of Cooking came out with their new version the same year, so they asked me to change the title. Um, I really loved the feeling of opening the door, you know, expanding the table, not closing it. And that's why it says for everyone. Um, I didn't even want to say vegetarian, but my publisher would not go for that at all. And plant foods for everyone just doesn't have the right ring, you know. But it's really about plant foods. It's not just vegetables. It's just the other side. It's the rest of the plate, you know, or it could be the whole plate. Um, but that's always been my feeling about vegetarian food is, is, is bring everyone to the table. Don't, don't say no. Um, for me, that's, that's important. Um, I recently came out just in March with this new version of it. Um, this is basically the same book, but it has quite a few changes in it, including a beautiful new cover without spoons on it, and um, and and it's already faded to a lovely yellow. So um, this is probably going to look, and it's not quite the Golden Bears, but it almost was <laughs> for a minute. Um, and the reason I redid this book is because our culture has changed. Um, we, have, we have new foods now that we didn't have before. You know, all those alternative plant milks um, I mentioned are some. Uh, coconut oil, coconut butter, ghee. Um, it's not that these are new foods. They're just new to our culture. Um, I, I made a little list here because... Uh, I was afraid I'd forget. We have new kinds of pepper, like uh, like um, shishitos and fushimi and um, padrones uh, that are very, very popular. We have millet that's now made into grits instead of whole millet, which is like infinitely better. Um, we have all these beautiful mixtures of seaweeds that make gorgeous salads, very nutritious, beautiful salads. Um, what else? We have these beverages like coconut beverage. It, not even coconut. It's not the coconut milk in the can, but you can pour it on your cereal and make a smoothie. We have smoked paprika. We have these Japanese chili mixtures like sashimi, togarashi. Um, there's just many, many foods. Farro, an ancient, ancient grain. Well, now we have it. And emmer and einkorn. We have pastas made out of einkorn. So the landscape of our food has changed. And of course, vegetable varieties in particular have expanded like crazy. Um, I wanted to put, because when I wrote this book in the 90s, people really thought tofu was going to save you. You know, if you ate it, it was good for Japanese people. So if we ate a lot of it, it would be really good for us too. You know, I mean, people were doing crazy things like just pureeing tofu in a cuisine and eating it for breakfast. You know, and it's stuff that just, you know, just get it in you. You know, and and instead of treating it as an exquisite food, which I think it really is, um, but now we know tofu is good food, but but not gobs of it, you know. Fermented soy is better, so we want more miso and tempeh. So there's a little bit more of that in the book. Um, but I kept the tofu recipes because they're good, and they're great for vegetarians to turn to. Um, there's a designation of vegan recipes because so many people are vegan, and I just wanted to make it easy for them to find it. This book is often used, maybe if you're vegetarian, your mothers might have used it. Um, you know, they say, oh, I have a kid who's vegetarian. I don't know what to cook for them. Well, now I have a kid who's vegan or raw vegan or whatever it is. So I thought, I'm going to help help her out <laughs> and help you out and just um, label those as well. I took away some recipes that were really rich or just too challenging or, you know, didn't seem right for our times anymore and put in 150 recipes that are, are much different than that, more contemporary. There's that no-need bread, which has become so popular, which we didn't even know about the first time around. Um, and 
I also am considering the fact that now there are experts in so many kinds of cuisine, you know, South Indian, you know, uh, Lebanese mountain cooking, um, you know, some little province and some section of Italy has somebody who's a master of it. So I, even though international food is usually the backbone of most vegetarian coll collections, I just... I can't take the role anymore of being an expert, because I'm not. I mean, I'm just one person. I come from one country, <laughs> and only one country, even though I've lived elsewhere. Um, I, I thought, it's, there are many, many voices now that we can turn to. So um, I, I kind of pulled back a little bit out of respect for those. But you'll still find, if you've used this book at all, your, your good old friends, for the most part. I'll tell you a little story. Um, I was talking about the process of redoing a book, which is very different from writing a book from scratch. And I mentioned that I had taken out a risotto gratin. I just felt it was too rich. I don't think anybody made it. Nobody ever emailed me about it. And two women in the audience said, oh, you can't take that out. We make that for each other for our birthdays. And I thought, staying in <laughs> because it meant something to someone it was obviously a celebratory food not an everyday food and of course we do have foods that celebrate and foods that nurture on a daily basis so they're all covered in there um, and I'll just conclude I want to mention um, before this came out last year I it came out with this book vegetable literacy um, this is just the cover of the books under here those are walking onions on the cover, um, which is really about plant families and their members and, and what they look like and how they behave and how much they're interchangeable in the kitchen. Um, so it's kind of an interest. I, I love this book. I mean, I, I grew all the, the plants that are in it, and, and it was quite a process. But I learned so much, and, and if you read this, you can walk around your campus, and suddenly you're saying, oh, that's a you know, walking onion or whatever it is, or that's in the grass family. So I'm happy to stop here if you need to get back to work, um, or if you have questions, uh, I'm happy to entertain them. Yes, sir. Um, can you address the issues supposedly around soy-based foods? I've been a vegetarian for 20 years, and uh, tofu has been a staple in our family. But recently, people have been rolling their eyes at me when I talk about tofu and soy-based stuff. Do you know anything about it? I, I don't know a lot about it. Um, I think partly it's uh, the estrogen that's in them. Um, uh, has Some people think that that's problematic. Um, I haven't sat down and actually read a lot of science on it. I think if they work for you, you know, you should enjoy eating them. But it, there is something about the fermentation that makes, the, makes them more bioavailable. So soy foods that are fermented like tempeh or miso or um, tamari or, you know, there's a bunch of them, natto, which I don't think will probably become real popular in this country. Um, I've had a hard time with it myself, and I'm pretty open-minded, um, that those are more beneficial than just relying on soy milk. Or, or tofu. My concern with the soy food is so much of it is GMO, unless it is stated, you know, USDA organic. And, um, and if you feel fine about eating GMO food, that, go ahead. I, I would avoid it myself. Um, I think that that's the pro part of the problem. I don't find soy oil or soy flour to ever have a fresh taste. Um, they always seem rancid to me. I think they're very unstable oils. But, um, you know, we ate a lot of soybeans at Zen Center, and if you cook them in a pressure cooker, they're really delicious, and they're really silky, and they're really soft, but they have to be com completely cooked. So, um, you know, it's like any bean if you don't really cook it. They're very high in phytic acids, and so that soaking, draining, putting fresh water on it, cooking them till they're really, really tender is good. But um, I think you should enjoy your tofu. I plan to enjoy mine. <laughs> Thank you for uh, providing the context around the origins of greens. So if, if greens was kind of on the forefront of pushing a lot of these trends, uh, kind of what is its role now? I mean, I know you're not involved, but I mean, what is the state of vegetarianism now and, and what is what role does greens play? You know, I live in a village of 200 people. I don't get out that much. <laughs> but 
I think, um, you know, I think Greens is probably maintaining, and it's a fine dining restaurant, and it, it's beautiful, and the presentation is beautiful, and they no longer Xerox their menus at the last minute. They they look really nice. It's more professional, so I think it's it's just there as a kind of anchor. But um, uh, we were just in Los Angeles this week, and and looking for some food, and went into it has a funny name. Do you remember? Um, went into a vegetarian restaurant that turns out to be a chain, and they did a lot of Persian food, and it was crazy and mixed up. It was um, cold tapas, hot tapas, um, who had, you know, it, that had nothing to do with Spain <laughs> at all. Um, but you know, everything was organic. Everything was really wholesome. It was delicious, and and you know, I was very happy to to know that you could we could just walk in and sit down, you know, and have it. The plates were pretty. They weren't, you know, super super constructed. But the fact that that's a chain. You know, and there's a lot of it, um, and and it's experimental. It's very encouraging to me. Um, I think vegetarian food is just a whole lot better. It's so much broader, and people are better cooks. They're better eaters. They've been exposed to more. Um, you know, every now and then a restaurant crops up as an example of new vegetarian cooking. That's not a big deal. It's not expensive. It's not a big date. You know, night. I think it's gotten better. I, I think we're more relaxed about it, which is good. What's it like to introduce a new menu or to try out a new dish? Because uh, I imagine if you're running a restaurant, you might have a certain quality to uh, uphold. And if you're trying out something new, it might be hard to uphold that. Yes. What's it like trying out a new dish? It's a little like a roller coaster flag and a ride in the wind at Six Flags or something. <laughs> it's... Um, Yes, I tried new dishes all the time. I, I didn't know any other way. That was my model at Chez Panisse, and it was um, breathtakingly frightening. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, you, you weren't sure if that's how they were supposed to be or, you know, if it was right, and the menu's printed, and, you know, it, it's... Sometimes my husband, when I'm trying a new dish, will say, you know, this isn't your best effort. And I'll say, I know, it didn't work. <laughs> but I think with more experience cooking, you, you start to know what does really work and what you can do um, and how foods work together. So you can eliminate a lot of false steps because you've already had experience you know, with them. Um, when I'm working on a recipe, three times is my limit. If I can't get it the third time, I set it way aside. Um, there's something that's just inherently not right or not working. Um, later, I might figure out what that is, or I might find a new approach. But, but generally, I've, I kind of can see you know, what works and what won't, and what the result will be. But yeah, it had its scary moments when you're doing it for other people. Are you associated with a, with a restaurant now? Um, and you know, uh, I'm just curious, you know, how, how you decide to be in a restaurant or not. Uh, is it just too intense? Or, or you... Well, I'm not associated with a restaurant now. I, I'm really, it's a young person's game. You all go to it. <laughs> I did it. But it's very hard work. And when I moved to Santa Fe, I did open a restaurant with David Tannis. And, um, and it had a great run for about six years. And it was a real farm-driven menu, as was Green's, as was Chez Panisse as well. Um, and, and that was my last restaurant experience. Um, it's hard. It's hard to be on your feet for 12, 14-hour days. I'm not exactly young, so I, I really don't want to spend my time being that exhausted when I'm, when I'm not at the restaurant. But I have to say, I think once you've done it, you always sort of miss it. And I'm always looking for, I mean, I will see a space, I'll say, ah, oh, that's what I want. I want a rest, I want that for my restaurant, you know, and I mean, come on, you know, but when, when you're working hard and when you're under pressure and as they say, in the weeds and everyone's cooperating and you're getting that food out, it's the best feeling in the world. Um, 
it's just a rush, you know. But part of what makes it good, I think, is really because you're working with others. You're not just by yourself. You're you're working as one body. You're getting through that night, and that is a real thrill. And I think that there are other ways to realize that quality of community in our lives. And um, it, you know, we have to find out what those are. It might be your workspace at Google. Maybe it's not, but it seems like. Like you have a lot of ways of meeting and talking and being together and working together, which I think is the best. Um, but like I say, physically, it's a bruiser. At my age, I should be sitting down in the corner of the dining room having drinks with customers. <laughs> but I do miss it. Well, thank you for your, your other books. I really especially love the introduction chapters about, about tools and foods and in general. But, uh, and all the great recipes. But Thank I was wondering about um, what was it like to start up uh, Greens? I mean, you weren't just starting a restaurant, but also just it was with a bunch of Zen students and stuff. I, I don't know. Oh, it was hard. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was an adventure. You know, I mean, it was an adventure every single day to start Greens. Uh, what are we going to eat? What could possibly be a main dish? Um, you know, how do you teach 10 people, you know, your lunch crew to not make silly little garnishes? <laughs> and, you know, I had to be very exacting, and I had to really lean hard on, on the crew to get that food right. And that wasn't always appreciated. You know, so I was a little bit battered between you've got to do this right and um, you have to be nice. You know, now I'm so nice with people, whatever they do is fine because I really didn't like the experience of saying, no, you can't do that. It has to be like this. Um, you know, but that's what I was there to do. I had to make that restaurant work and that's what it takes. Um, but it, it, was, it was a difficult ride. I mean, starting any restaurant's hard. It's just so hard. Alice Waters told me, she said, you won't go anywhere for six months. And she was right. And it, practically on the day, I got to go to Grafeo's in North Beach to buy coffee. I got to leave the restaurant in the middle of the day. And I went to the Bohemian Cafe and I had a beer and an anchovy sandwich. <laughs> and, and then I went to Grafeo's and got the coffee. Oh my gosh, the feeling of being outdoors in the sun. I could eat something different that didn't, you know, you smell like your food and your clothes are saturated. It's, it's like you can't ever get away from it, you know. So to have that experience was, you know, it, it shows you how much you're really wed to your work. It's 24-7. Because there's no time when you're awake, in bed, you know, after you, you come down at the end of a night, you're wired, you may be exhausted, but it takes two or three hours to calm down so you can go to sleep. And then I was a Zen student, so I'm up at 4.30 the next morning, you know, for Zen meditation, for Zazen, you know, um, I was tired. It, it was hard. But um, once you get it started, then it, it has its own life, you know, and it goes. For someone who's learning to cook, are there any techniques, practices, or tips that you think are especially useful for transforming cooking, taking it to the next level? How do you transform food to bring it to the next level when you're learning to cook? Use a good knife that's sharp. You don't need a lot of them, but you need a knife that's sharp, and you need the knife for the job. If you're cooking a lot of vegetables, you want to have a long, flat surface. You don't want a bony knife that curbs. You know, because you're only going to have that much of it that's in contact with your food. So you choose a good vegetable knife. Give yourself a lot of room to work. So many people work on a little tiny board that they got as a wedding present for a cheese board or something, you know, and that's their cutting board. Get a big board. Give yourself lots of room. Have a sharp knife. A tool to sharpen it. It doesn't have to be a steel. There are lots of cool little tools that are magnetized. You can pull your knife through. It makes it all so much easier. It really does. But I think you, I can't remember if you mentioned you had this book or if it was somebody else, but there are, there's a lot about steps to make things easier. You know, you have to remember that cooking isn't a linear process. Food TV makes it seem very linear. You know, everything's prepped. 
you're going like that. You know, that's not how it is. You know, when you get home, there's nobody left you a mise en place, I'll bet, you know. <laughs> Maybe someday, but not today. You know, so you have to know, okay, while the onions are cooking down for your soup, that's when you're going to chop this or you're going to do that or grind your spices. But, um, you know, to think about it as a, a much more organic, you know, way of approaching what you're doing will help help you a lot. Um, there are suggestions, there's 10 suggestions for making it, making it easier, but start with, I always tell people, if you're just learning to cook, but you know something about what you like to eat, start with those dishes. If you love stir fries, which I don't, but if you do, make stir fries, you know, until you get really good at it. If it's gratins, make gratins. If it's pizza, you can make lots and lots of pizzas. You know, kind of focus and until you have that intuitive, it's in your body and you can just do it, you know. And then you might look at a recipe and say, oh, I didn't know you. I could use kohlrabi and it's great with mustard because they're in the same family and a little, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, I think people who are starting are very ambitious. They're exposed to so many tastes and foods. So ask yourself first, what do I like to eat? Look for those recipes, you know work on those. This book has a lot of um, fundamental kinds of instructions because I taught people how to cook. I taught my crew how to cook, you know, so I, I can't get away from it. I'm always, you know, wanting to make it easier for people. So does that help? Sharp knife, big cutting board, <laughs> lots of bowls to put things in. Start there. It was mentioned in the introduction that you had been involved with the slow food movement, and I was mm -hmm. hoping you could talk a bit about what that is and what impact, if any, it's had on your cookbook writing. Oh, I don't know um, what kind of impact slow food has had on my writing. Um, slow food started actually when I was living in Rome in the mid-'80s um, as a response to McDonald's um, opening on the Spanish Steps. And that was very painful to a lot of Italians, the Spanish Steps, McDonald's. And so a group got together and they made pasta, bolognese or some kind of pasta. And they stood in front of McDonald's and they said, don't eat that, have some of this. You know, um, like, and it really started because so many of the little trattorias or cafes were closing. Um, they no longer existed. Um, you know, they people were going for fast food, and they didn't want to lose that part of their culture. The same things happened here, by the way. I mean, it's very hard to find a good family-owned cafe, very hard. It's mostly just awful. And, um, you know, so that the movement started with that, and then it grew to, well, what about our foods and other customs, and not just Italy, but Europe, but the US, China, you know, all kinds of countries have lost many of their foods and how could they be brought back and appreciated. It was about slowing down. Anyway, it's hard to find an elevator talk speech for it, but I always used to say, people say, what's slow food? And I said, well, you've heard of fast food, right? And then something clicks, you know, they've heard of fast food, so slow food is saying something to them. And um, I've been involved with slow food for a really long time. Um, I used to wear a lot of hats in that organization, but the most important one to me was the um, ARC and Presidia Committee, which was very involved with identifying those foods that had historical and gustatory significance. And in America, we have lots of them. We have lots of old apples and plums and fruits and grains and all animal breeds, all kinds of foods that have, have disappeared for just something bigger, faster, cheaper, whatever. So it's been very involved in bringing these foods back. They're a part of my, my pantry to the degree that I can. So I would say it, it has introduced me to foods that I've, because I've used them in these books and talk about them. Anybody can buy real wild rice. You know, you just go on, you just Google it and go online and you can buy it if you don't live in Minnesota, you know, and it's completely different from California patty wild rice. It's totally different and it comes out of a culture that's still alive, you know, so you could choose to support that. So I do, and, and I do incorporate those things in my books. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>